All right, well, good morning, all. We're gonna go ahead and get rolling here. And I know as a few minute, last minute logins will come as we go, but we'll let them catch up as they can. Um, I do ask everybody, please mute, um, just because it gets confusing if there's a lot of background noises. I am willing to take questions in the chat bar if you wanna type them in as we're going along. Or at the end of the session, we'll let people unmute and, uh, and ask questions verbally if that's for the preference. Um, so today's class, for everybody who doesn't know me, uh, my name is Darren Morgan, nursery manager at Chenard's, and today's class is fruit tree spraying. Uh, so we're going to talk about spraying both the dormant season spraying, which is what you're doing now, and a little bit about future sprays to maintain healthy and uh, bug-free uh, fruit trees. Keep in mind uh, that all of these recommendations, it's kind of um, a gradient. Um, even with excellent spraying, sometimes things happen and sometimes you can skip some sprays and still have good success. So you need to find your balance point and understand that um, every year might be slightly different as well. Uh, we are focused on fruit tree spraying. A lot of the information does apply to other small fruits and even to some extent to ornamentals, uh, but bear in mind that is the focus of the class is specifically fruit trees. All right, so the first question when we're talking about spraying fruit trees is, well, what's the point to all this in the first place? Uh, what are we trying to accomplish here? And um, the thing you keep in mind with uh, fruit trees, it's not like trees growing in the wild. You get wild seedling apple trees out there in the, in the wilderness or whatever. Um, they sometimes have disease problems. They sometimes don't. Nobody's really managing them. The trees usually survive and all. But the varieties that you're intentionally planting and trying to produce were specifically bred for specific fruit characteristics, productivity, and manageability. That often excludes breeding for significant amounts of disease resistance, or uh, and there's no real way to get bug resistance when the when the uh, bug pressure gets high. So um, they kind of need the spraying to maintain good quality of fruit, and it's certainly not a, a an every time thing, but if you get in the habit of doing it, you'll have good success. And if you are familiar with the techniques and processes, you can make informed decisions year by year on what you need to do. So our fruit trees are um, subject to a number of um, insect and disease problems. Some of them are really, really significant. Others can be relatively minor or cosmetic. And so again, you can make your own informed decisions about what your degree of tolerance of a few blemishes or an occasional bug in the, in the fruit might be. Oh my God. <laughs> so spray timing. Um, ideally, we want to do a lot of preventative sprays rather than um, doing a lot of heavy sprays during the growing season. So preventative sprays are done during the dormant season when there is no foliage, fruit, or flower on the tree. It enables you to use less product, to use less toxic products, and to focus on disease prevention rather than disease treatment. However, not all problems can be resolved through dormant or preventative spraying. Um, some diseases spread only during specific weather conditions, so you need to be treating them when the weather conditions match. Um, in other cases, um, for example, a lot of the insects that are in fruit pests, um, a lot of those pests are not treatable. They don't have a form that's available to treat during the dormant season, so you kind of have to do them um, when they're there, when they're present, which is while the fruit is maturing. So, Dormant season spraying won't take care of everything, but it can be a preventative for a lot of serious problems. So during the dormant season is literally what you're seeing right now. Um, we can start dormant spraying um, as the temperature declines in the fall, right before or immediately after leaf fall. The advantages to spraying after leaf fall are pretty significant because you use a lot less product. Um, and we are focused with the dormant sprays on primarily disease prevention, though there are a few insects that can be controlled uh, in the dormant season as well, just not normally the insects that are inside the fruit themselves. So the disease groups that we're treating in the dormant season are usually fungal or in some cases bacterial infections. We are trying to prevent these and we're using primarily um, basic elemental products, um, sulfur or copper products 
or lime sulfur, the, the classic orchard compound. Um, all of those products work well on fungal diseases. Um, lime sulfur is one of the best overall fungicides out there, but it's fairly caustic, use it reasonably respectfully. Um, lime sulfur and sul elemental sulfur really do not do a very good job of preventing bacterial diseases. So when you get into a situation where you want to spray as minimally as possible, um, we often focus on using the copper because it does both. It does both fungal and bacterial diseases. Um, more than one spray is definitely beneficial. We're trying to control spores, prevent the development of the disease, expansion of the disease during the off season, but prevent spores for re to prevent reinfection. And um, so you may need to do multiple sprays to get a really good coverage. Um, so you want to be spraying two or three times on particularly disease prone or, or trees with a history of disease problems. On mature established trees with minimal or no history of disease problems, often a single spray is sufficient. So we talk about trees that really are significantly disease prone. Um, we talk about all the stone fruits. Um, and the reason is not that they get so many more diseases than apples or pears, plums, but stone fruits like cherries and peaches and nectarines and apricots, the diseases they get are pretty persistent, um, are really, really frequent, and can be severely damaging, especially to a young tree, um, where a leaf spot uh, or scab on apple is a problem, but it's a problem that can be dealt with over, over a period of time, over even several years to get it under control. Uh, lilac bacterial blight on a cherry tree, uh, on a young tree, can kill the tree outright, and on a mature tree, can cost you um, substantial amounts of branch structure. So, th we that that is one of the things you want to remember when you're looking at your trees. Is some are inherently more susceptible than others. And there's also variety level thing. A lot of the varieties of apple you see in the grocery store, like Braeburn, there's no disease resistance at all bred into them. On the other hand, you can find and buy apple trees that have a lot more disease resistance, like Liberty or Freedom uh, or Pristine, for example, disease, disease resistant varieties. Even in the stone fruits, there are some disease resistant varieties, but there are um, no uh, Im immune varieties. Uh, got a comment in the chat, the slides aren't moving. Is anybody else having that problem? Are we not moving along again? We can see your copper fungicide and yep. dormant spraying okay. slide right now. Okay, Lauren, you may need to refresh um, uh, because refresh, I think uh, we're, we're getting the overall, uh, getting uh, overall progress. Uh, uh, okay, so insects can also be restricted or reduced during the dormant season. Um, but not all insects. So your typical in-fruit insects like codling moth and apple maggot, cherry fruit fly and spotted wing drosophila um, do not actually control in the dormant season. There are some, some physical controls you can do um, and there are some in-season sprays and we'll cover that very shortly here, but you can't control them during the dormant spraying cycle. On the other hand, scale insects and mealybugs are really common on a number of fruit trees and um, significant numbers of um, mites, uh, both, uh, both spotted like a uh, red spotted spider mite um, or the mites that occur inside the leaves, like inside the leaves of, uh, of pear trees, the eriophid mites, can be controlled with sulfur sprays used as a fungicide and an insecticide, or particularly with a lot of these insects, with spray oil. Spray oil is a great suffocant and it catches all stages of insects. It suffocates eggs, it suffocates larval and, and uh, larval stages and pupal stages, and also um, can, uh, since can suffocate adults. Uh, beyond the insect and disease problems, we get a lot of questions about controlling moss and lichen on fruit trees. We are a really humid climate all in all, and the trees themselves create a pretty good canopy that, also, that both restricts some light, but also tends to trap humidity inside. That tends to uh, encourage a lot of um, lichen development. And it's mostly what you're seeing on trees is not actually mosses, it is actually lichens, they're a colony organism. With that in mind, um, they're not really parasitic. 
uh, the lichen development on a tree is usually just a visual thing. It's not usually hurting anything. We do have some concerns when lichen gets excessive. When lichen gets to the point where it's out on the ends of the branches and it potentially is covering over some of the available uh, buds, that can be a problem. Or if you're getting just so much density of, uh, of, of lichen on the tree that you're worried about the weight load, you know, that does hold some moisture in. And then if you get those freezing rain events, it could actually add quite a bit of branch weight. So there's reasons you might want to thin the lichen. Now, copper spray does reduce lichen and moss to some degree. It's much more effective on mosses than lichen. So less effective in the tree, more effective in the lawn. Um, sulfur sprays and spray oils do a pretty good job of knocking back lichen. And don't expect that all at once it will resolve. Uh, it may take several years of repetitive spraying to really burn back all that lichen development. It doesn't immediately go away after you spray it either. It, you may have to do either some stripping out or just let it age itself out. You're just killing partial layers of it and it does keep trying to grow back some. Um, but that can be a, an effective treatment for, for, for lichens in trees as well. So application of sprays during the dormant season. This is the, the, the chronic question uh, at the nursery here. And one of the most difficult sometimes to, to find the right windows of time during the dormant season in Western Oregon. So when you put a spray on, you're trying to have that spray not get over diluted with rainfall and not be frozen on, while it's wet on the trees during its drying window. Depending on weather conditions and exact spray used, that drying window is usually somewhere around four to six hours in the winter in Western Oregon. Okay. So you need to spray your dormant sprays when we're gonna have no significant moisture events, nothing even, anything beyond a very, very tiny light mist, um, and no freezing temperatures for four to six hours. So that means you may not be able to spray first thing in the morning if we're actually below freezing, uh, heavy dew, can be a problem if your tree is substantially wet from dew, you're gonna over dilute your product some. Um, and you don't necessarily spray very, very late in the afternoon because you might get back into freezing temperatures very, very early uh, and watch your forecasts. So we want that to not over dilute, we want that to not freeze. And the over dilution is a amount of time thing. Um, if you can get a spray that has had on, that's on the tree that's had no substantial rainfall, not just light mists and dews, but no substantial rainfall, for 48 hours, that spray was probably successful. If you spray and then it pours the next day, that spray was probably not successful, and you'll want to repeat that spray the next window you have. Because you might want to spray different products for different reasons, spray oils for insect control, sulfur for fungal diseases and lichen, or copper for bacterial diseases, you might want to be using different products on the same tree in the dormant season. And that's fine. In fact, rotating products like that is a very good idea. However, you should separate those products by at least 48 hours so you're not creating a, a mixed situation that's not working well. These are products that cannot usually be tank mixed together in the sprayer and that you could create damage potentially to the buds of the tree um, if they're combining at the same time. Um, if you got a good successful spray, spray that was on for at least 48 hours, and you're looking at repeating the same product on the tree, um, two to three weeks is kind of your, your window of, um, of gap that you wanna put in there. If you're spraying more frequently than, than a two or three week interval, uh, you're probably wasting product. You're probably not gaining much in actual disease control. So spray is done, if you do your first spray in late January, early February on early mature, early developing trees like pears and plums that flower really early in the season, you may not have time to get a second spray on. One of the reasons we sometimes start a little bit earlier in the season. Another thing I wanted to say about um, timing your sprays is that when practical and possible, you gain a lot more mileage out of your spray by doing your spraying after pruning. Now, that's not always possible. You're not going to prune in October, but you could start spraying in October if you have particularly disease-prone trees. 
Uh, but it is an efficiency thing. It's, it's something you might want to keep in mind. Uh, if you get your pruning done and then you go out the next day and do your spraying, it's not a bad process. And you're using a lot, again, a lot less spray because you're spraying a lot less material. So we talked about the start time and weather conditions. Well, when do you stop dormant spraying? It does vary a little bit from product to product. So do read your label directions. Remember that labels are important on these products. Um, generally speaking, you cannot continue to dormant spray um, as the buds begin to develop because you will damage the buds, the flowers, potentially um, ruining your fruit yield for the year. Uh, these, these dormant sprays can be damaging to, to, to otherwise healthy tissues. So evaluating how far out a flower is, is a bit of a, of a practiced eye kind of thing. Generally speaking for home gardens, what I'd like to see is you can continue spraying dormant sprays at full dormant strengths because some products have different dilution rates for other times of the year. Um, up until you can actually see the hint of flower color on the flower buds. The buds go through a fairly um, extensive changes as, as the season progresses and your, your flower buds will typically begin to swell and even pull a little bit away from the branch and expand and become more green and less, red, le less reddish brown. And you can still continue dormant spraying all through those cycles. But the moment those, those shucks, those outer covers on those flowers begin to crack out and you can start seeing the pink or white flowers underneath, you're ahead to stop. Um, your commercial orchardists will sometimes throw um, some specialty sprays right in there in the bloom sequence, very carefully timed. It's probably not a huge benefit if you're doing otherwise um, consistent spraying uh, and it's easy to time it wrong and make a mistake. So if you just stop at, at, the, at the color and flower buds, spray nothing during the flowering cycle. No dormant products, but also no growing season products until the tree is completely done flowering. One little exception to that, older trees that tend to overproduce, particularly old apples, sometimes older cherries, uh, definitely older pears, you might intentionally put a last fungicide on after about two thirds of the flowers have finished, but you still have some late flowers opening. By putting a dormant spray on then, you're getting your last minute fungicide in during one of the most infectious and hardest to deal with periods of time, that, that spring cycle when we're still rainy and the flowers are finishing out and they're really susceptible to infection. You're also burning that 25 to 30% of the flowers off and those flowers won't set fruit, so you have less thinning to do later. Um, it's an optional approach um, and it might be practical for your situation, so something you might consider. So growing season sprays. During the growing season, um, we have the potential to treat problems that either we weren't able to treat dormant, um, or perhaps we didn't get as quite a successful dormant control as we wanted, or maybe there's just so much disease and insect pressure in your immediate area that you're having additional problems. So these uh, dormant, these active season sprays are not normally our first line uh, of defense, and it would not be our first priority. Uh, we would love to see you prevent as much as you can and only treat during the fruit production season as much as you absolutely have to. Um, in practical terms, that means, yes, there are some fungal diseases, occasionally bacterial diseases that you will continue to treat through the growing season as they occur, if they occur. And there are insect problems. Uh, codling moth, as you see in the picture, attacks apples, pears, sometimes uh, apricots, um, walnuts. Um, a really significant insect pest, and you can't do anything to speak of about it during the dormant season, so you're, you're going to have to deal with it during its, uh, during its growing cycle. When you're talking about insect sprays, it, it's worth keeping some sort of history on your trees and what's happening, as well as a, an eyeball on what's happening in your neighborhood. If you've got a lot of neglected and unsprayed trees around, you'd better timed prevent the insect problems. Know when they're going to be occurring and time your spray before you actually see problems. Um, if you don't have much history of insect problems in your apple trees or your, or your cherry trees um, and you don't have lots of big orchards or neglected trees around, you might choose to simply um, take a wait and see. The problem with the wait and see is by the time you know you have a problem for a given year, you can no longer do anything about it the die is cast. You're, you're stuck with that for this season. You can deal with it for next season. So that's, that's the caution about taking a wait and see on the insects. So there are a batch of um, 
in growing season insects on fruit trees. Um, the codling moth is one of your classics and it has two generations a year. And in between the two codling moth generations, apples sometimes get uh, apple maggot, a completely different insect. Um, there are a number of small fruit flies, including the new kind of obnoxious uh, spotted wing drosophila, one of the new fruit flies for our area, that attack a range of uh, fruits, including cherries and plums, um, and some less intensive to the home orchard uh, level things. Um, there's some stink bugs and such that do some damage as well. So there are definitely insect controls that have to happen during the growing season. There are some follow-up or last chance sprays for fungus diseases during the growing season, particularly things like peach leaf curl and cherry shot hole that are really hard to completely control dormant. Um, and that's what we'll talk about a little bit in this section. During your growing seasons, um, you have a limited uh, array of products that you can use that are safe for you and the tree during its fruit production cycle. None of these products should be used while the trees are in flower. These are, uh, these are after flower during the production cycle. Um, there, um, mostly, I'm going to focus on the organic options. I do want you to keep in mind that if you're not fixed on being an organic gardener and you're having significant disease pressure, you do have some options that are a bit stronger during the growing season. Well, the vast majority of my clientele really does prefer the organic, so that's where we're going to be focusing today. So during the growing season, we do have some fungal and bacterial controls, uh, bacterial being much more limited. Biological sprays, sprays that are mostly themselves bacteria that can either outcompete for growing space uh, with the disease pathogen bacterials or simply stimulate a tree's immune response to make it less susceptible to bacterial diseases. They are not super, super strong fungicides and bactericides, but they do go both ways. They do control both fungal and, and bacterial diseases. So not strong enough to be your, your dedicated control and not usable during the dormant season, but as a follow-up to dormant sprays, or um, if it's dormant sprays for some reason didn't get done, uh, they give you at least a window of option. Sulfur sprays do, as we mentioned, co control both fungal diseases and some insects, particularly mites. We can use sulfur, particularly elemental sulfur, um, during the growing season. You can use lime sulfur in the very front end of the, of the growing season as well, but it's at a different dilution rate than during the dormant season. These sulfur sprays do give us some options in the front end of the growing season, but should not be used late into the season. As the weather gets hotter, sulfur becomes more reactive with the tree. Um, and additionally, uh, a number of fruits actually show blemishes or other damage from sulfur that is applied too late in the season, regardless of actual temperature range. So sulfur can give us a gap spray right after bloom before the fruit is setting or in the very tiny fruit steps in the very early spring while it's still cool out, but should not be continued into the hotter part uh, of the summer. Neem is worth mention too. Neem, um, whether you're doing it as true neem oil, or clarified hydrophobic extract of neem or some of the pure neem products that are not extracted oils at all but are, but are in tires. Um, neem is marketed primarily as an insecticide and it's a fairly effective insecticide on a wide range of insects. It does also have a limited application as a fungicide, uh, particularly mildew and some of the spot diseases like apple scab, some of the rust diseases. Um, it can be effective and it can give you a, a kind of a two-step control, some insect control as well as, uh, as well as good fungicide. Neem can usually be safely used pretty much through the season. Um, watch your temperature ranges, read your instructions carefully. Neem residues on the fruit very late in the season need to be washed off. It's distinctly bitter. It leaves a very unpleasant taste in the mouth if you don't get all the neem off before you, before you eat. So insect control is a lot more complicated. I'm going to kind of give you a bit of an overview of it, but I want you to keep in mind that when we're talking about insect pests, it is really critical that we figure out exactly which insect you're having problems with because different insect life cycles and different insect susceptibilities to different products mean we really have to match a specific product to a specific insect to have good control with our organic options. Um, Typical insect problems, we talked about um, the in-fruit problems, the, the major ones, um, spotted wing drosophila, um, 
and cherry fruit fly, uh, apple maggot, and codling moth. Codling moth is the most challenging overall to control, though spotwing drosophila is definitely up there uh, quite a ways. Insects that are primarily larval insect stage feeders, which are most of our in fruit pests, are responsive to uh, larval insecticides, things like Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis, um, or things like spinosad, which is a bacterial toxin. Um, the problem is getting them, those products to the insect while it's in its larval stage can be, can be limiting. So often we focus on trying to control the reproductive adults rather than focused heavily on actual larval control. Um, codling moth has two generations a year. There's a generation in May. That generation develops inside the fruit, climbs down the tree, down into the ground, pupates in the ground, emerges as a flying moth again uh, in the summer. That moth then comes out and starts relaying mates, starts relaying eggs for us, a, a generation that occurs usually about August here. That generation does prune plums, um, it's pears, less on apples, though we do see some damage from it on apples, and occasionally walnuts. Um, it's usually too late for most, most of the peach and apricots on that second generation. So if you're having an ongoing codling moth problem, you're likely to need to address it in two windows of time. To get good control of these relatively spread out uh, insect generations, you're gonna usually need to do multiple sprays. Codling moth is usually done as a timed spray to control the adult stage early in the season. Um, so we try to, there's, there's very, a variety of forecasting models you can use. Um, easiest way for the home gardener is to probably check with the extension service. They actually trap and monitor reproductive females and when they're seeing enough of them uh, in the traps, they say, okay, time to spray. And then you'll do two or three sprays about seven days apart for, for codling control. You can use spinosad for that. It's pretty effective on codling moth. BT has been used for a long time for that. Um, you can use neem and pyrethrin with the, with the note that neither of them have a very extensive control time frame. So you may need to do a little bit more spraying if you're using the contact insecticides like neem and pyrethrin versus, um, versus spinosad or BT, which have a little bit longer duration. Um, the spotted wing drosophila is uh, a nuisance because it has multiple generations per year and it moves from one fruit to the other through the cycle of the fruit production year. So you might see it on blackberries or on blueberries and then on blackberries and then on um, then it moves on into the tree fruits, onto the cherries, sometimes plums. Um, so any individual crop will need to be sprayed separately depending on its maturation cycle. A question in the chat, um, how often to spray for adult codling moth? Your typical spray cycle for codling moth is two or three sprays, seven to 10 days apart um, at the beginning of the, of the first de 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 detection window of, of significant amounts. You can try to just calendar time it um, and that's usually about mid-May for the first generation and early August for the second generation. And if you're doing that every seven to 10 days over that window, you will probably catch the vast majority. Again, it's not perfect. There will be ones that sneak through. But two or three sprays, seven to 10 days apart, um, mid-May-ish and uh, early August-ish. Uh, spotted wing drosophila has to be controlled separately on its different host plants. So on blueberries, um, we, they typically uh, infest in as the sugar content rises. On cherries, they're usually coming in ahead of the actual ripening sequence where the cherries are just beginning to turn first color. Um, usually two sprays or occasionally on long sustained crops, three sprays. Uh, neem is probably your best overall control at this point, though spinosad is also being used. Um, you may never get rid of all the spotted wing drosophila. Uh, they are a very widespread pest now. And besides the commercial fruits, they attack a whole batch of wild fruits like solau. Um, so it's really, populations are pretty significant in the immediate area. And we're having a lot of problems controlling it. And commercially uh, in ag business, this is a huge problem, of course. Um, cherry fruit fly and apple maggot are summer sprays, um, usually June uh, or uh, June or into July for apple maggot. And uh, spinosad can work on those uh, or pyrethrin or neem can work on those as well. And again, time sprays, um, 
a little harder sometimes to forecast the exact biological cycles on those pests. Fortunately, they are less common or significant pests in our area as a whole. That's kind of an overview on the in-fruit pests. Besides the in-fruit pests, of course, we do have mites. Um, spider mites are a hit and miss problem um, and more hit than miss lately with our hotter, drier summers increasing our mite populations in the valley. Um, spider mites create a stippling or a speckling on the leaves. You see it on the top of the leaf, but the mites are actually living on the bottom of the leaf. And they're a sucking insect, kind of like a, kind of the way aphids do. They're sucking, a, they're sucking on the leaf tissues. Uh, mites can be controlled with oil sprays, as long as it's not too hot, with sulfur sprays, as long as it's not too hot. Pyrethrins do a fair job. Neem does a really good job. Mild amounts of spider mite can be controlled with just water under pressure, just literally hosing off the underside of leaves, but enough pressure to, we do that a lot on ornamentals, enough pressure to knock the mites off on a fruit tree may actually damage the fruit. So probably not your best choice in an orchard situation. Aside from the spider mites though, we have eriophid mites. This occurs in grapes, of course, but also pears in the tree fruits. So these are mites that come into the leaf tissues um, during the bud stage before the leaf actually expands. Um, so they're actually moving into the leaf tissues, and by the time you see the characteristic bubbling and warping of the leaf, you really can't control that pest uh, anymore. It's, it's no longer at a, at a stage where it can be controlled. It's between the leaf tissues. So good news is eriophid mites are mostly not sig huge, huge pests. They're not going to kill the tree. Large populations will affect your yield, absolutely but you have time to control them. So when you see that, that what they call blister mites, uh, the blistering tissues looks a lot like peach leaf curl, which we'll look at the picture out in a minute. Um, just know that you're gonna have to control that next year on those plants during the dormant season before the buds actually swell and, and, and develop. Um, and usually a fairly minor pest all in all um, and not too hard to control with those dormant sprays of sulfur or oil. Um, scale insects and mealybugs are, are less common in the valley, partly because our winters are typically cold enough to reduce those populations. Um, they're best controlled dormant. It's really hard to control those insects in the tree um, because they're, they're covered with a shell that doesn't let insecticides in. So what ends up often being systemic approaches, uh, which you don't want to do in your fruit trees. Uh, but oil sprays in the winter, if you're having problems with scale or, or, or mealybug problems, can definitely help with that situation. Question check. Can you dormant spray any time before bread bake, even into early spring? And also, is there an online diagnostic tool to help diagnose and treat fungal and pest problems? Um, absolutely to both. So your dormant spray does often continue into the early spring. Um, until bud break, until actual flower color showing on the, on the buds, you can continue dormant sprays. We don't, in Western Oregon, we don't warm up enough in the early spring to worry about temperature thresholds. Um, and, that, and that is a, obviously a different situation in different parts of the country. So you need to be aware of that. Uh, my background is here in the, in the wet and cool Pacific Northwest and doesn't always apply to places like the Southwest or the Deep South. Diagnostic tools. For our immediate area, uh, the Pacific Northwest handbooks, PNW handbooks uh, online, excellent resource. Um, and there's a separate handbook for insect problems and a separate handbook for disease problems. There's even a weed one. Um, and they're compiled by Oregon State University and Washington State University and Idaho State University. And we used to have to buy these multi-hundred dollar books every couple of years to keep up to date on new pests and new products. So it's now all available to everybody free online. You can just go online and browse through it. There's great descriptions of the symptoms. Um, there's uh, recommendations of treatments. Um, you do need a little bit of background and understanding what they're talking about when they're, when they're making specific uh, specific things you're looking for in insects or things you're looking for on the plant, but an excellent, very user-friendly guide. And I use that a lot for diagnostic here because yes, I've been doing this for 30 years, but there's still always good to keep up and refresh. And there's still a lot of stuff out there. You, you do have to look up a lot of things. It's just part of the game. Um, okay, another question in chat, dormant sprays on citrus. And, um, to be honest with you, my experience with citrus is limited to indoor outdoor as a house plant because I don't live in a climate where we can grow citrus outside. And um, 
my understanding is there are significant insect problems that are dormant, dormant season controlled. Um, occasional fungal problems on citrus, but there have not been a significant issue, um, at least my, my experience with them. Uh, insects are the dominant problem. And yes, you can um, definitely use uh, dormant sprays for control of, of scale mites, mealies on citrus. And let's see, the question was to see if we can put this in the chat. I'm not going to put it as a link, but I will type it in. I believe it is a dot org. So take a look at that. That should give you your, your link out to those specific, uh, specific guidebooks for diagnostics. So a couple of spray examples is typical of what we're talking about in the, uh, in the spraying situations. Oh, pardon me, question a little bit earlier in chat. Temperature threshold for spraying. Um, for dormant spraying, temperatures need to be um, above freezing and stay above freezing during the drying window. On the summer end, it does depend a little bit on the product. Products that tend to have temperature sensitivity, um, like sulfur and oils, they tend to rate somewhere in the 70s as you're, as you're cut off. Most other sprays are fine up into the 80s. Never spray anything when we're bone dry and, and 95, 96 degrees. Um, it's really hard on the trees. Uh, so avoid spraying during real hot, hot spells. So a spray example, codling moth. Again, one of the most significant problems. Uh, primarily a pest in apples and pears, does occasionally do walnuts, apricots, even peaches, and uh, the fall plums, the prune plums. Um, two generations a year, May and August, we like to do a, a BT or a neem, or I like spinosa, just what I use a lot at home, Captain Jack's is my brand. Um, two to three times, 10 to 14 days apart, as frequently as seven days apart under high pressure, 10 days is usually about ideal. If you want to not really look through the be dependent upon the, the extension service postings. Um, your timing cycle for codling moth is approximately 20 weeks after the median peak point of blossom. Uh, and, and they base that usually on your, uh, uh, on, on your, the majority of flowers being out. So um, that puts us usually early to mid-May for our start of our, our spray cycle. Um, Apples often do not need the follow-up spray in August. Uh, their skin is thicker by then, uh, so it's less likely to get infested. On the other hand, pears and fall plums um, often have a problem uh, with that August generation. So those are the trees I would focus on the follow-up sprays. And it's the same cycle, two, two to three sprays, about 10 days apart. And classic example of codling moth inside. So quick little diagnostic, uh, tip on apple specifically where we have multiple similar pests that you notice at about the same time. Codling moth usually comes in from an end of the apple, goes up and down through the core, creating this very large cavity with lots of caterpillar poop, frass, uh, inside the tunnels. And then ultimately, as you can see in the picture here, exiting out a side hole. When you see the side hole on codling moth, that's the exit hole where the larva emerged to crawl down the tree and finish its metamorphosis on the ground. Apple maggot might come in from any facing of the fruit, usually comes in through the fruit surface, that's through the skin, and burrows these irregular tunnels through the flesh of the apple, does not make a, a straight line for the core, does, goes, goes irregularly throughout the apple uh, flesh. So that's probably the easiest way to tell the two apart you know, for, for dealing with the, the next year. Speech leaf curl. Um, so, you see the blistering like that, and people automatically assume eriophid mites if they're familiar with eriophid mites, because that similar, similar texture on a pear is indicative of blister mites, eriophid mites. Um, peach leaf curl is a fungus disease, and we like to prevent it with dormant sprays, and dormant sprays are great. However, a lot of the actual infection with peach leaf curl happens after dormant sprays are practical, um, after, at, right at the end of the flower cycle and as the leaves are emerging when we're consistently wet and really common here in Western Oregon that we might stay wet through maybe May. So we often get infection and then reinfection with peach leaf curl throughout the spring when we can no longer do dormant sprays. So the, the leaves will contort, they will turn a variety of shades of yellow to chartreuse to yellow to even red and orange. 
And then the infected leaves will suddenly drop fairly much in mass pretty heavily. Uh, and that's really what does the damage. The damage to the leaf tissue, of course, interferes with photosynthesis, but the heavy loss of that much leaf tissue and then having to, the tree having to regrow it takes a ton of energy. Uh, it can be very stressful for the tree and can really reduce or, or even eliminate your, um, your fruit crop. So an important disease to keep under control. Um, we like to dormant spray. Copper has a little more lasting power on the branch, so we tend to use copper, but sulfur is very effective as well. Um, but past the dormant season sprays, we often need to follow up with biological fungicides or even occasionally neem, but uh, I'm really a big fan of the, using the, the bacterial biologicals like moderate complete disease control, um, revitalize. Uh, there's, a, there's a batch of brands out there designed specifically for that. Um, and with those in-season sprays, you need to be after all the flowers are done. And as long as we're going through this fairly consistent moist and overcast pattern where we've got lots of humidity, occasionally rainfall, um, and we're never really having two or three days in a row of drying out, you just keep spraying every week to 10 days until the weather changes or until the leaves stop coming out like this. Now, we'll put it as a kind of a kind of an extreme example like that with large-scale tree defoliation. It's really common to have a good job of dormant spraying and have one or two leaves on a branch uh, begin to show a little bit of curl. There's nothing wrong if you're paying close enough attention in your individual orchard to going out and plucking those leaves off as soon as possible to prevent reinfection. If you do that every few days, you can sometimes, if you're not being too heavily hit, you may be able to um, get past doing those, uh, those in-season sprays just by physical maintenance. But once it's established in and it's going to town, and you've got lots and lots of leaves involved, that's just not practical. And that's where you would need to step up to the in-season sprays. So techniques and, and, and tools. How are you doing the spraying? We've talked about what you need to do. Uh, the products we've covered here are, are basically organic products, relatively safe to use. That doesn't mean you want to be really crazy with them or take no precautions all, whatsoever. Do read your labels, read your label instructions carefully. If you're using a product and you haven't used it for a few years, labels change depending on new research and, and legislation. Read them again, make sure you know exactly what you're getting into. Um, mixed up sprays don't keep. So there's some experiential uh, learning here too about how much you will need. Um, you know, little baby fruit trees in that first two years or so, you might get um, uh, you know, half a gallon of, of spray will cover a whole tree. A mature apple tree usually takes between two and three gallons of spray. A really big old fashioned apple tree that's not dwarfed might take four or five gallons to cover. But try to figure out how much you're gonna need for the job you're doing and only mix up as much as you're going to use because it doesn't hold. Uh, appropriate tools do matter. A, a little, little baby tree you can do with a little trigger bottle. You can do with a, with a little bit of a pump up sprayer. Um, but the bigger trees will need a larger scale sprayer so you're not stopping and mixing halfway through the tree. You can, so you can do the job efficiently and sprayers that give you a good mist pattern. So the goal in a dormant spray, it's a little different during your growing season sprays, um, but you want to get a complete coverage of the, of the tree being sprayed, which means from the branch tips down to basically ground level to the, to the collar where the, where the root collar comes up. And you want to saturate all those, uh, all those surfaces to the point where water to other spray is actually running down the branches and beating up and just beginning to drip off. You don't need to get past where you're creating a stream dripping off all the branches, but you should be getting beads. You can see in the picture there, I get the little uh, little uh, droplets of copper spray. You can see the blue green color that, that indi indicates what it is. Um, and that's a good level of finished spray. We've, we've, spray. we've covered that whole surface to the point where it's dripping down and just beginning to, to beat up and drip off the tips of the branches. That's a thorough covering of spray. It's much harder to do that um, during the growing season because you have all the leaf mass on. Your point, at point uh, during the growing season is to try to get a relatively even coverage over all leaf and, and tip surfaces, the best you can do. Um, but one of the reasons we like to do the dormant spraying is it, it's much easier to do the dormant spraying than it is to do in season sprays. At the end of your individual spray cycle here, um, you want to 
dispose of your any mix you have left over because it's not going to hold. It, it doesn't hold. I mean, if you're going to spray another tree, maybe a couple of days, sure, keep it and 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 remix appro appropriately. But um, past a couple of days, um, things go wrong. Uh, so generally, don't keep mixed spray. Um, always check your labels, but the general rule of thumb for mixed fungicides and insecticides is that you want to dispose of the spray in situ, in the area you're spraying. Um, so you can go back over the tree surfaces again to disperse the last of the spray. You can, you, with, with fungicides in particular, you might hit um, a, an ornamental nearby that might have some problems. Lilacs typically have problems. Dogwoods frequently have problems that copper spray can control in the dormant season. Uh, even turf, even uh, copper can be sprayed onto uh, grass for some disease problems and for moss control. But get it dispersed out onto the ground or onto the plant surfaces until it's gone. Double rinse your sprayer to clean that, to clean it out. So add water into the empty water, sprayer, water, agitate, water, it agitate it up again. And, um, and um, and uh, spray it through, shake it out, dump it, water in again, shake it up and dump it. And that should uh, all in all clean out the sprayer. Um, we don't want to have contamination of the sprayer because we might put other products into it that, that don't interact well with the spray residues from behind. But also many of these sprays, uh, copper is a classic example, but neem, which tends to be fairly, uh, fairly soapy in, in many consistencies, they can gum up the spray works to where you have to just throw the sprayer away and buy a new one because it gets so plugged. So good cleaning at the end is very, very important. Protective equipment. Follow your label directions. Generally speaking, with these organic products, you, you have a little bit of leeway. Make sure you're trying not to, um, to make sure you're protecting your eyes and your mouth and nose. Um, basics, these are not toxic fume products at this stage. We're trying to keep actual droplets and mists out of your, out of your breathing and out of your eyes. Um, at the end of spraying, wash your clothing separately from other clothing. Just get it washed through so you have ultra spray residues out and clean yourself thoroughly, uh, soap and water. If you venture into some of the non-organic sprays, um, Captan or some of the others, and there's sometimes good reason to do so, um, the cleanup may be a little more involved. You might want to use a little more safe protective equipment because of fumes as well as, as droplets. But generally speaking, you know, copper, sulfur, neem, uh, spinosad, BT, uh, as long as you're not breathing it, drinking it, or getting it in your eyes, it's pretty safe all in all. Okay, question in the chat. Um, leaf miners in grapevines. Um, a question about that specific question. There's, there's a lot of problems in, 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 um, in small, uh, small fruits. Um, are we talking about blister mites? Or are you actual, actual leaf miner? Um, if you want to get back to me on that, Heather, I'll, I'll try to answer your question as best I can there. Backpack sprayers. Um, I hesitate to recommend brands of sprayers simply because they change so much and I've never been completely happy with any of them. Solo makes generally pretty good sprayers um, and Hudson makes pretty good sprayers all in all. There's some, some that we've used uh, quite a bit. Uh, comment uh, in the chat, organic does not mean non-toxic. Yes, follow your labels, please. Read the labels. Um, and you do have to be aware that Organic is not non-toxic. Many organic products can be toxic uh, and that you do want to be very respectful of. So do indeed read your labels. So um, eyeglasses and regular cloth masks, sufficient eye and mouth protection for sulfur and copper. Yes, eyeglasses I worry a little bit about if you don't have safety glasses over them, you can. Uh, if you're wearing a good beak hat and, uh, and, and, and glasses, you're probably adequately protected. But remember, you're looking up spraying up. I would err on the side of more protection and wear safety glasses in general as, as a protection. Um, the cloth mask is usually quite sufficient or, 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 a, or a 95 mask is quite sufficient because neither sulfur nor co copper have fumes that we're concerned about. It's literally just particulate mass getting into your breathing. That's all you're trying to protect yourself from. Other products, different rules. So 
talked a bit about spraying. You see my little uh, my little micro sprayer there that I use on some of my smaller trees. It's actually a pump up pressurized sprayer and it's a one and a half quart capacity enough to do a single tree at a time usually. Um, and uh, measuring device because measuring isn't about guesswork. Read your labels and more product is definitely not better. Follow your labels specifically for the time of year plant being treated and product being applied. Um, uh, but good, good measuring device. Generally speaking, if you do a mixture of organic and non-organic garden, for example, organic in the edible, non-organic in the, uh, in the uh, ornamental aspects of your landscape, separate measuring devices and sprayers to keep your organic sprayers with organic product. Herbicides are of course a special case. Um, and generally I would like to see you have a specific sprayer for a specific, uh, for, for herbicide applications and other sprayers for non-herbicides. It's really hard to get all the spray residues uh, from herbicides out of a sprayer effectively. Um, and, okay. okay, so Heather got back to me, actual miners, so uh, leaving interesting and pretty designs in the leaves, yes. And they're um, not a huge problem in my area, but we, we've seen them, we see them in a lot of other ornamentals, aspens get, uh, get, a, get a notable leaf miner like that. So leaf miners, unfortunately, are not treatable when you see them, they are between the leaf tissue areas. Uh, small scale infestations, your best approach is to remove the affected leaves before they finish reproducing and come out with another generation, just like we do with uh, leaf miners in, in chard and spinach, for example. On a larger scale, um, I would have to look at the specific leaf miner. I'm not familiar, too familiar with the one on grapes here and check what the life cycle is, but you'd want to control your reproductive adults before the eggs are laid. Uh, and that's that's the critical thing with with leaf miners, just like with areophyte mites. You've got to time it very carefully. So that's what I've got for you at this point in time. Uh, I would take any que additional questions in chat, or if anybody wants to unmute and ask questions verbally, I'm here for you. Uh, question, good question. Since I was not able to access right on time, um, copy of the recording. Uh, it will take us, usually takes us between two and four days, um, and this will be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, so feel free. Um, I think last year's is still on there, and you can sit side by side and see how I did, uh, <laughs> as if, you, if you want to sit through that much uh, spray lecture. Um, they will all be posted, and there's a batch of other classes. My last, uh, last week's fruit tree pruning class, um, we've got beekeeping classes, vegetable gardening classes, short classes, long classes all kinds of stuff available now on our YouTube. So check it out, please. All right, other questions for me before I get back to my other job, which is actually waiting on customers here. Oh, good questions, good. Okay. So could I ask a question about the, um, I kind of missed the point you were making about uh, the thing that looks like peach leaf curl, but on pears. Yeah, so pear blister mite. It's an areophid mite. Um, we have a similar mite that affects grapes. Um, and so it is a mite that comes into the leaf tissues before the leaf develops in the bud stage as the leaf's just getting ready to emerge. So by the time you see it with that blistery texture, um, you can't treat it. It's there in between the layers of the leaf tissue, completely encapsulated in the leaf, and nothing short of very strong systemic insecticides can possibly reach it. So rather than treating it then, make a note of it. And the specific mite in question is easily controlled with either sulfur or with spray oil in the dormant season, particularly later in the dormant season as the buds are beginning to swell. Uh, unfortunately, I say by the time you see it, you can't do anything. The good news is areophid mites, while they can impact yield, and when they're severe, they can add, add some stress to the tree, they're not going to kill your tree outright. They're not going to completely ruin your harvest the first time you see them. You have some time to get it under control, so don't panic when you're seeing it the first year. If you've got individual leaves with just a, just a couple individual leaves, sure, you can pluck them out, um, but just make notes and plan on that dormant, either sulfur or oil treatment, uh, in the late dormant season next year. Great, thank you.
Okay, how many times should you spray? Um, that's a question everybody has to answer a little bit for themselves. Dormant sprays for fungal and bacterial control. I would like to see you get two to three sprays on in the dormant season. Um, this is really particularly important for things like peaches and nectarines that have a lot of later season diseases. If you've got a mature apple tree that is not really having much disease problems, you might skip a year or you might do just a single solitary spray as a maintenance product. Um, if your problems are increasing, you're seeing um, uh, the, the scab, which is black spots on the fruit or sometimes on the leaves on apples and pears, or if you're seeing rust, the, the blistery bubbles that are orange on the underside of the leaf and on the bottom of the fruit, um, which is easily distinguishable from areophid mites because it actually is a, it develops a, a spore. It's a powdery spore. It'll rub off on your hands orange. Um, if you're getting those kinds of problems, get back into a more significant spray schedule. But generally, um, I, like my peaches and nectarine, I, um, because I'm doing this, the whole immediate area, I did the, the apple as well. Um, I've hit them two times this year so far. I might squeeze a third in if the weather cooperates and if time fits. But I, I do like to get at least two on three is better for the more susceptible trees. Ah, propagation question. So a little bit out of class, but I'll take it anyway. How do you har when and how do you harvest sci scions and keep them? So for grafting, you need to harvest scion wood from the tree you're trying to reproduce. And then you graft it onto the rootstock or to another tree um, to develop the, the variety out, so grafts. Um, cyan needs to be corrected, collected in the late fall. Um, so it's too late to collect cyan wood now, November, December. Then you cold store it as it calluses up, and then you actually do the grafting as the sap rises in usually like late February, early March. So too late to harvest cyan wood and too early to graft. You're right in the in-between cycle right now. Um, old apple and pear trees with fertilizing help. That's a really excellent question. So trees that are in good health with good irrigation practices, good fertilization practices tend to have less problems. Um, that's certainly not an absolute. So it can certainly reduce pest and disease problems. Less on the pests, more on the diseases. Fertilizing is a, is, a, is a significant question in orchards. And there are some guidelines you can use. I mean, orchards, they actually do bioassays where they actually take leaf mass in, they have it evaluated to see nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. A home, home gardener, you're probably not gonna get that carried away. We're gonna focus heavily on available nitrogen because that's probably the biggest limiting factor for fruit trees. And um, the guidelines are, what is it doing growth-wise? So obviously when you prune an apple tree, you get water sprouts come up and we're not considering those. We have our main, uh, anchor branches are scaffold, and then we've got the production with the fingers on the outer edge of the branches. Those fingers, if you're getting 18 to 24 inches on an apple or a pear, you have plenty of nitrogen. If you're getting six or eight inches on that lateral growth, you're nitrogen deficient. You want to be somewhere in between that number. Micronutrients sometimes play a role too. Um, calcium in particular on apple and pear. Uh, bitter pit, in apple is literally just calcium deficiency. You may be able to help that by applying lime, um, watching your pH because you don't want to get them too alkaline, pretty hard to do in our immediate area anyway. Um, you may not be able to correct that completely by liming. There are foliar calcium supplements you can put on if that's an ongoing problem. Um, treat calcium deficiency symptoms by reducing nitrogen because calcium is used up in the branches that you're then pruning off the next year. Um, consistency of watering um, and then reducing the overall um, intensity of pruning you're doing because that's stripping calcium out. Also fruit thinning on calcium deficiency problems on bitter pit because trying to ripen too many fruit all the calcium has to get evenly distributed out amongst the fruit and if you've got too many fruit it doesn't get enough on any one fruit. Uh, I didn't mention it, so thank you, Chris, for pointing out. Our YouTube channel um, is, is Shenard's Nursery. Um, so if you go to YouTube and Shenard's Nursery, or if you go to our, our, our website, you can find links out to our social media stuff as well. Is it advantageous to spray dormant oil multiple times between now and bud break on apple and pear? Dormant oil doesn't give you a lot of bang for your buck on repeat applications. Um, if you're trying to get some decent insect control on aphids, scale insects, and that kind of thing through spray oil or lichen development, getting a single spray on in the dormant season is probably quite adequate. 
Um, it won't hurt to do two, three is probably excessive. I don't think you're gonna gain any, any ground that way. Pair slugs, good question, a fun one. Pair slug and rose slug, very closely related and sometimes go back and forth between the two, um, is actually a, a fly larva. Um, and it creates some tunneling um, on the outer, on one surface usually of the leaf, uh, creating a, a hollow see-through where you've got a leaf surface that you can actually see the light through. Um, small amounts of pear slug are pretty minimal. Larger amounts of pear slug should be treated. The good news is pear slug is easily killed. Um, insecticidal soap, the, the mildest organic option, is, is quite effective on pear slug. Neem or pyrethrin control pear slugs quite well. You will seldom have to do more than a single spray. You don't have a lot of multiple generations of them coming out typically. Uh, Mike, you got more propagation questions. Um, why don't you give me an email, uh, Darren, D-A-R-R-E-N, at chenards.com. I'll talk with you in a little more detail about, about propagation. It's a little bit off topic for the class as a whole. I get a leaf curl on your apple trees. Attention, get a tree, leaf curl on your Liberty apple. Um, the normal curling on apples is most likely a mite or an aphid problem, not a disease problem. So look inside the cup of the leaf and see if you've got small insects down there. That's the most common. Severe cases of apple scab, also sometimes a problem in the Newport area because of the even wetter than, than us in the valley uh, climate, um, which could be dormant prevented. Um, best bet, you can bring me a sample. You can shoot me pictures of a sample. I'm happy to look at those too, but look inside the cup. I bet you it's an insect problem because Liberty seldom gets much apple scab and that would be the only significant contorter usually besides insects. Uh, timing on the different products, sulfur and copper during the dormant season. So sulfur is a better fungicide. Copper does fungal and bacterial. If in doubt, if you just stick with copper, you're getting pretty much everything. Um, and they should be, you can use them alternately. You can use sulfur one spray and copper the next. It's important that you don't overlap sulfur with copper sprays more recently than about 48 hours to allow for, uh, and, and frankly, you're, you're not gaining anything by, by spraying that frequently. If you're spraying two or three weeks apart, you do sulfur one day and, and one spray and copper the next two to three weeks later, not a problem. You'll have no problems. Um, same thing goes with, with oil sprays. They should be definitely separated. Sometimes you will overlap them much more quickly because you're doing different things. One's a fungicide, one's primarily an insecticide, um, but still separate them by 48 hours for safety. Um, and I kind of addressed the next question down. How many, how many days, be weeks between sprays? Two to three weeks is a good interval for spraying. Uh, more frequently than that is, is not gaining much ground for the amount of, of money and time you're spending to do it. Question about doing a class on fertilization. We've considered it. Uh, I'll put it back to the, to the team and see on the marketing team if we think we've got enough. It would more likely be a smaller um, instructional video rather than a full class, I would think. What is the latest one can spray neem on trees? You can spray neem throughout the season anytime the temperatures are below about 90 degrees. Um, and just bearing in mind that if you're two to three days before harvest or so, you really need to scrub those apples, uh, those fruit pretty carefully because the neem residue is bitter. So that's, that's your best guidelines I can give you on that. It's neem is rated as safe up to the day of harvest. Um, very, a very small number of people do have allergenic type reactions to neem. Um, but the flavor issue is significant and I've, and I've, I've done that. I've actually had neem on, on fruit and then eaten it and not washed it thoroughly enough and, and can attest to the bitterness of the neem product. I want to thank you all for attending a wonderful class and I say check out our YouTube. Uh, don't hesitate to email me or otherwise contact us here at Chenards if you have any follow-up questions or, or, or separate questions. That's what we're here for. Thank you very much.